welcome and thank you for standing by. All participants will be in a listen-only mode into the question and answer session. During that time, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1. I'd like to inform all parties that today's call will be recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I'd now like to turn the call over to your host, Ms. Karen Fox. You may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I am Karen Fox with NASA's Office of Communications, and I am excited to uh, welcome you today to a media briefing on Mars sample return and its architecture. We have a few speakers uh, lined up to, to talk at the beginning, and then we will move over to questions uh, and, and take questions from the group on the line. Uh, the speakers we have today are Thomas Zerbuchen, the Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters, David Parker, the Director of Human and Robotic Exploration at the European Space Agency, Jeff Gramling, Director of the Mars Sample Return Program at NASA, and Francois Spoto, Head of Mars Exploration Group at the European Space Agency. We will start with our uh, presentations, and then uh, they'll hand it back to me, and we'll start the questions. And with that, I will hand it over to Thomas Zerbuchen. Hey, thanks so much, Karen. And uh, I want to tell you, I'm in Europe right now, and I've given quite a number of uh, presentations, both in the U.S. and in Europe. And recently much about the James Webb Space Telescope. And uh, I, I just, as I'm sitting here uh, thinking about Mars sample return, I recognize the enormous analogies of this. Uh, both are historic missions, both are international. They're big missions that are both difficult, but are very much worth doing. And uh, in the case of uh, what's happening with Mars sample return, they're happening the mission is happening right now as we speak, because while the Perseverance rover continues collecting scientifically selected samples on Mars right now, we're pleased to be here today with our European Space Agency partners to provide an update for bringing those samples back to Earth. The Mars Sample Return Program is nearing completion of its conceptual design phase. During this phase, known as phase A, the program has been working diligently to study concepts for returning the high value samples with the greatest degree of success. Considering this phase, uh, this, uh, during this phase, uh, the program examined a number of configurations to collect the cache samples from the surface of Mars and deliver them to the land the lander carried by the Mars Ascent vehicle that will bring it back home to Earth uh, on the Earth return orbiter. Early this year, during phase A, we announced an iteration that added a second lander to carry the sample fetch rover to Mars due to the mass requirements of the missions. We're learning a lot as we go forward, not only about the analysis of this, but also about perseverance that's, at, that's you know, right now uh, on Mars. And so now with the conceptual design phase nearing completion and following the mission definition and review, we have a path forward using a revised and innovative architecture. We reached our decision based on new studies and recent achievements at Mars that allowed us to consider options that frankly weren't available to us one year ago or before. This new architecture relies on the Perseverance rover as the primary delivery system to bring samples to the sample retrieval lander, where ESA sample transfer arm will load the sample tubes into the Mars Ascent vehicle built by the United States. And we're adding two Ingenuity class helicopters as backups to transport the samples to the lander. The successful operational demonstration of the Ingenuity helicopters on Mars, frankly, was key to allowing us to consider and adapt to, to this change. So I'm going to hand it over to my colleague and friend, David Parker, the Director of Human and Robotic Exploration at ESA. You've introduced Karen, our partner in this effort, to discuss ESA's very important contribution to the Mars Sample Return Program, including the sample transfer arm and the Earth Return Orbiter. David. Thank you very much, Thomas, and good day to everyone from my side. Yes, thank you very much. It's a, a great to have the opportunity to participate in this update on the Mars Apple Return Program. Uh, it is for ESA uh, a very exciting program and a very important partnership with, uh, with our friends at NASA. 
I would say that Mars sample return is, is a unique mission because it combines both scientific and exploration goals by returning what I say are priceless scientific treasure from the red planet that will be studied in laboratories here on Earth worldwide for the next 50 years. It will answer fundamental questions about Mars, its early history, and its relationship with the Earth, and, and indeed the whole of the solar system. A very, very simple example, but an important one. Uh, it will allow for the very first time absolute age dating of rock and soil taken from a known geological context on the red planet, and therefore, therefore provide ground truth to calibrate the age of all of the features of Mars for the first time. So as uh, at the same time Mars sample return is, is, you can think of it as an essential precursor or a stepping stone to an eventual human mission to Mars by demonstrating the, the engineering and operations of a complex multi-element mission up to 400 million kilometers from Earth. So I give you just one engineering, one scientific example to emphasize this point. Uh, ESA's Earth Return Orbiter that we're building right now, it's uh, well into its Phase B and uh, past the preliminary design review. The Earth Return Orbiter Aero is a multi-stage spacecraft equipped with both chemical and solar electric propulsion, uh, more powerful than has ever been used on any previous planetary mission. So it's a technological challenge. But aboard the Earth Return Orbiter will be a radiation sensor being developed by one of our participating states in ESA, the European Space Agency, that's Hungary. And they will be this instrument will measure the total radiation dose experienced over the whole mission. So traveling to Mars, operating Mars, and returning home to Earth. And this will therefore provide important information to assess the risk to future human explorers. So having set the context of the Mars Sample Return Program, I'd like to hand over to uh, my colleague Jeff Gramling from NASA, who is the Mars Sample Return Program Manager there. Jeff, please. All right. Thank you, David, and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I, we've reached a significant milestone in this campaign to return samples from Mars. Of course, the architecture for that campaign, beginning with Perseverance, is really designed to go where the, the scientists uh, want to go to, to collect the samples to answer the, the questions that are, are being asked. Of course, we've already collected, uh, Perseverance has already collected nine scientifically selected samples that are, are, are there and uh, ready to be brought home. On July 15th, we completed the mission design or the mission definition review looking at the overall program, including the architecture, the requirements, uh, mission or the uh, organization, risk, and schedule. As Thomas described, key to our new architecture is a recent assessment of Perseverance's reliability and life expectancy based on its performance to date. And that assessment also took into account the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, performance of Curiosity that's nearing its 10th uh, year of, of operation on Mars. There's, there's much shared uh, heritage in the mobility system. Based on that updated assessment, we have uh, confidence that the rover will be available to deliver samples to the sample retrieval lander in 2030 when we need it to be. So it's the primary path. Recent operations of the Ingenuity helicopter on Mars, which have completed uh, 29 flights, 24 more than originally planned, have shown us the usefulness and potential of rotorcraft on Mars. In recent months, studies conducted at JPL have evaluated the possibility of adding Ingenuity class helicopters to retrieve samples and to deliver them to our, our lander. With those studies, we are confident in adding helicopters to perform the role of, of backup to perseverance and transporting the sample tubes to the re sample retrieval lander. The two Ingenuity class helicopters will be carried to Mars on the deck of our lander. The single lander will also carry the Mars Ascent Vehicle and the ESA-provided sample transfer arm. The plan for Perseverance is to drive to the landing location of the sample retrieval lander. There, ESA's sample transfer arm will extract the samples from Perseverance and load those samples into the Mars Ascent Vehicle. While we're adding helicopters as backups, many components of the program have not changed from the original architecture. We're, we we're, have a single sample retrieval lander now augmented with the Ingenuity class helicopters, the Mars ascent vehicle, the sample transfer arm, and East Earth return orbiter, 
with the NASA provided capture containment and return system. All of those remain unchanged. It's still early in this program. Our next key decision point is in September, at which time we expect to finalize the new architecture and move into our pre preliminary de design phase, which is phase B. Uh, next, we will hear from my colleague, Francois Spoto, the head of the Mars Exploration Group at ESA. Francois? Thank you very much, Jeff, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to, to everyone around the loop. Uh, a, a lot has been said already, so I will focus a bit more on the ESA deliverables, uh, which are Earth Return Orbit uh, and Sample Transfer Arm, and make also some, uh, some comments on Sample Transfer Arm, which was also one of our development until now. So, Earth Return Orbit. Uh, uh, the mission is between preliminary design and critical design review. Uh, critical design review will happen in September uh, next year. Uh, the launch is due uh, in 2027 uh, uh, in order to secure uh, the return of the samples on Earth in 2033. That's pretty important. And ERO is carrying uh, one major payload delivered by our friends at NASA, the Future Containment and Return System Payload, the CCRS. Uh, and together with uh, uh, this payload, AERO will be able to rendezvous the orbiting sample in orbit around Mars, uh, approach this orbiting sample carefully and capture it before bringing it back uh, uh, to Earth, where basically in the desert of Utah, uh, samples uh, will, be, will be recovered uh, and transferred into a safe and, uh, and controlled place for um, uh, 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 later utilization and, uh, and scientific exploitation. STI sample transfer arm uh, is a robotic arm, pre pretty comparable to a human arm, actually. Uh, it is equipped with a greater at the end, which is able to catch samples, samples from Perseverance. Uh, initially, it was also designed, of course, to catch samples from sample fetch rover, and it is now being uh, adapted to catch samples from uh, uh, the uh, gripping helicopters as well. Uh, the contract was signed in July, so very, very recently, uh, at the opportunity of the Farnborough Air Show UK. Uh, with a company in Italy called uh, Leonardo. It's uh, an international group that has also a branch uh, in space robotics. Now, Sample Fetch Rover uh, is until now one of our, uh, of our development, and we had reached PDR. Uh, but we've been working very hard with uh, NASA over the last 16 months, I would say, to, to try to consider uh, and to reevaluate uh, what will make the mission ultra reliable in order we build the maximum level of confidence into a safe return of the sample we want to return for scientific exploitation. And finally decided that the best for the mission uh, was to discontinue the search rover. Why? Also because at that time we had a, a very clear understanding of the extreme reliability of the Perseverance rover, which is or was in itself designed and conceived to bring uh, the samples uh, uh, to the bottom of the landing platform, where STI would be able to fetch uh, from Perseverance the samples and then them over. Uh, to the Mars Ascent vehicle that was uh, mentioned before by, uh, by, by Thomas. So by doing that, we limit, of, of course, the risk uh, 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 to the overall mission, and we also avoid significant extra cost because we can return to the very initial uh, uh, concept where we had only one single uh, lander uh, within, within the system. Now, by the way, this is a configuration we've been reviewing two weeks ago at the level of the mission definition review together with, uh, with NASA, where the program was exposed uh, to a board uh, of experts who are basically to consider uh, the work on until now uh, and the capability of the teams uh, to switch from a phase A to, to, to a phase B. And the review was quite successful, even though we collected a number of very good hints on how uh, to make the, the mission more secure and more, more reliable. Uh, now, I would like to say that uh, uh, until now, uh, let's say this cooperation has really started in 2020. This is the time when we signed the, the memorandum of, of, of understanding. So we have already quite a significant experience to deal with each other, uh, especially with my colleague uh, uh, Jeff, who, who is in the group as well. Uh, and the relationship between both organizations is very good, and, uh, and also uh, together with uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, with uh, 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 in charge of the of the campaign uh, re realization under under NASA. Now, uh, after James Webb uh, Space Telescope, I, I think MSR is once again uh, an excellent case uh, of cooperation between NASA and NASA, and we are all uh, really motivated uh, at NASA to really push this program forward and to make it a good success uh, together. Thank you. I, this is what I wanted to, to, to mention uh, as an introduction. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. We will move on to uh, the questions portion. However, I do think we have an update about the samples. So I was going to toss to Thomas to give us an 
update about uh, where perseverance is in its sample count. Do you mind, uh, Karen, if I just kick this to uh, my colleague who's also here, who is not a speaker right now, but is, of course, thinking about these uh, samples more than anybody else, and that's, uh, of course, Minnie Wadwa, who's the MSR principal scientist. Uh, Minnie, do you want to do the update quickly and tell us what happened last night? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, Thomas. Um, so, yeah, we've actually got an incredible uh, sample suite already that we've collected um, to address some of the highest priority science questions, as, as David Parker said, you know, priceless scientific treasure. Um, so we actually have um, 10 samples, rock samples, that have already been sealed in stores, stored and an 11th sample that we are in the process of doing so. Um, and these represent an amazing suite of materials. The, the latest one, in fact, is a fine-grained sedimentary rock that we hopefully, you know, will contain some of the, um, ha has the greatest potential for preserving uh, biosignatures uh, potentially. And so, um, you know, we have, again, a diversity of materials already in the bag, so to speak, and, um, you know, really excited about the potential for bringing these back. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and now we really will go to the uh, Q&A portion. Uh, so I'm going to toss it quickly to our operator, Becca, uh, to remind everybody how to get on the queue, and then we will start taking your questions. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one. Again, that is star one. One moment, please, for our first question. Our first question comes from Elizabeth Howard with space.com. Your line is now open. Good morning. Um, not sure who can answer this, but I wanted to find out how those ingenuity type helicopters would work, you know, how uh, mechanically they would pick up the samples and do the retrieval. Thanks so much. Hi, this is Jeff. I'm my colleague Richard Cook, who is the program manager at, for Mars Sample Return at JPL, is here with me, and I think he he's, can answer this question. Sure. Uh, so this is Richard. Um, the the basic approach is to to build a helicopter uh, or two helicopters actually to look a lot a lot of ways like uh, ingenuity in terms of size uh, and overall mass a little bit heavier but, but basically the same size uh, with a couple of notable differences. One is that there will be rather than landing legs there will be landing legs that include at the bottom of them uh, mobility wheels basically some very uh, small uh, wheels. Um, for that allow the the helicopter to to traverse across the surface on the ground um, as well as fly and and secondly the the each of the helicopters will have a a little arm basically um, that can reach down and and grab onto a onto one of the tubes that that the sample tubes that will be that will persevere will have placed on the surface of Mars and so in the in the scenario that we're talking about where the helicopters are used, each of the helicopters would be able to operate independently. They would fly out to the to the depot location from where SRL lands, would land in the proximity of the sample tubes, roll over to it, pick, pick one up, um, then fly back to the proximity of the lander, roll up to the lander and drop it in a spot on the ground where the, the ESA sample transfer arm could could pick it up and put it into the map. And so each helicopter would be doing that separately um, and over the course of three or four days or four or five days per per tube would go basically sortie out and get a tube, bring it back, sortie out and get another tube back and 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 bring bring all the sample tubes back to the proximity of the lander that way. If I may ask a quick follow up, what's the primary mission of the two helicopters? Uh, so the, it, the the situation that we're talking about is that they would be used as a backup to bring the tubes uh, back to the lander. There's also the the possibility that we can do other things with it, you know, in terms of um, observing the area around the lander, um, you know, potentially taking pictures of the the MAV launch when the MAV does take off, things like that that we're still talking about. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we are ready for our next question. Our next question comes from Marcia Dunn with the Associated Press. Your line is not open. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I'm, I may have missed it in, in the course of conversation, but when is the targeted launch of the Mars SN vehicle with the helicopters, and what is the targeted date for 
getting these samples back on Earth. And, and was the switch to using Perseverance as the main pickup vehicle and the two helos as a backup, was this driven by price savings and or uh, saving time or, or some other reason? Thank you. Um, so this is Richard Cook. I'll answer the first question, and I think Jeff will answer the second. The, the, the planned uh, arrival of, of uh, SRL uh, on the surface of Mars will be in mid-2030, uh, 2030, and the MAV will launch about a little less than a year later, so early in 2031, leading to a uh, return of samples to the Earth in 2033. What was your second question, please? I'm, I'm just wondering what led the drive to using Perseverance as the main pickup vehicle with two helicopters as backup. Was that to save money? Was that to save time? Um, what, 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 what drove that decision to use what you've got instead of having some something new coming from Earth? Thanks. So the 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 plan has always been to use Perseverance, and and we had the sample fetch rover as well. We had two ways to bring samples back in the in the architectural revision that uh, we have uh, we're again we based on the results of our reliability assessment we're we're going to plan on using perseverance as a primary because of you know, what we've seen on on you know, the performance we've seen on Mars today both of perseverance and curiosity so we have confidence that that we can count on perseverance to bring the samples back and we've added the helicopters as as a as a backup means of to assure that, in the event of a perseverance failure, that we can, uh, you know, that we still can bring samples back. We this mission is is simpler. It's less organizationally complex, and we believe now that we have an architecture that, uh, again, is simpler and and is going to position us for success based on the the analysis we've done. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on to the next question. Our next question comes from Bill Harwood with the CBS News. Your line is now open. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure who this is for either, but uh, three quick ones about the, the helicopters. I, I don't recall the weight of the sample tube. I know it's in a press kit, but I was wondering the max weight that these two retrieval copters can carry. Wondering how far can they sortie uh, to go pick up a sample? How, what's the max distance from uh, the lander that you would want to send them out and bring them back? And you keep calling this a backup. I guess what I'm wondering is if Perseverance stays healthy, is there some chance you wouldn't use the helicopters at all? Or would you plan to pick up at least some samples with the helicopters just to demonstrate the technology? Thanks. Uh, so this is Richard again. I can answer the questions. The, 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 the filled sample tubes are about 100, are less than 150 grams. Um, so that's the, the you know, it depends on how much, of course, sample is in them, but with a fully built-up tube, it could be as much as 150 grams. Uh, I think you asked about the sortie distance. So the, the maximum distance that we think the helicopters would need to sortie out and back out is like 700 meters. Um, and and we've, we've demonstrated flights about that long uh, on Ingenuity, so we know it can, it can uh, make it that far. Um, but... but the, the reason why it wouldn't be longer than that is because we're landing SRL very, very close to where the depot uh, of tubes would be. Um, that, that SRL is being designed to land within about 50 meters of a spot on Mars that's got a pinpoint landing capability, and that will allow us to get very, very close. Uh, the, the question you asked about the scenarios for which the helicopter are used, it, it very much depends on how Perseverance has, you know, health uh, looks over the next eight years. And, and so that it could range between, you know, only needing to be there to support, uh, you know, the, the final uh, approach of Perseverance, you know, as well as some of the other things I talked about, or it could be needed to, to move all of the tubes, uh, again, depending on, 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 which, on what happens with Perseverance's operations over the next uh, eight years. All right, thank you. We'll move on to the next question. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one. Our next question comes from Kenneth King with New York Times. Your line is not open. Hi, thank you. Um, so I guess this would be for Richard or um, how, um, or actually for Perseverance people, how is this going to affect Perseverance um, mission and where would the notional landing spot be? 
would it be outside the crater because that's where Percy would be heading to, or would would you double back? So, so yeah, many might want to jump in on this too, right? But the 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 basic plan for for perseverance is to continue to do the Jezero Delta campaign that they're in right now and, and acquire a set of samples, you know, over the next few months, um, which could be, which will likely be put into a first depot uh, on the surface sometime later this year as, as a sort of insurance policy, you might say. And then after that, you know, drive up through the Jez the rest of the Delta, um, Jezero Delta, and then eventually leave the crater and go on to the Midway uh, site, which is some of the more ancient um, terrain on, on Mars. And and, and in, in, the, in that case, it would continue to acquire samples um, through that whole time frame. And so, in fact, we could land SRL out, you know, wherever uh, Perseverance ends up. Um, and, and the intent is that it not come back to Jezero in that case. I don't know. Minnie, you want to add anything else? No, I think uh, your main idea is that the uh, you know we don't really we haven't actually changed anything about uh, planning for where the you know samples depot. So the first yeah you're right the first depot is most likely is going to be in a few months time within Jezero Crater as an insurance policy and then and then we'll of course carry the rest of the samples and of course I mean Perseverance has been uh, collecting duplicate samples which means that you know there'll be a set of rock cores on board that will be duplicates of the ones that are going to be deposited within Jezero and we'll carry those out with it uh, towards Midway and continue collecting. Thank you so much. Um, that was Minnie Wadwa, the Mars Sample Return Principal Scientist, uh, and again, Richard Cook, who is the Mars Sample Return Program Manager, who has been invited to, to answer some of the more detailed questions here today. Uh, with that, we will move on to our next uh, question. Okay, our next question comes from Marina Corinne with The Atlantic. Your line is now open. Hi, uh, Marina Corinne with The Atlantic. Um, two questions. So it sounds like Perseverance has got a promotion here. Uh, will the team need to make the rover do any operations and maneuvers that the machine wasn't expected to do? Um, and then second question, uh, Martian helicopters are still, I'd say, a pretty experimental technology. So what would you do in a scenario in which both Perseverance and the new helicopters then fail? Thank you. Let's uh, start off with Jeff Grambling, and then we may uh, go further with Richard. So we so we have the two paths to bring the samples back to our our lander for you know that we would ultimately use the map to launch them into orbit. Those are perseverance remaining healthy and and the helicopters. Um, what was the first part of the question? Uh, the first part was just about the the, the um, are we changing the way we're going to operate perseverance? The answer to that is no. That the the intent, well, as many said all along, was to for Perseverance to get uh, a, a great set of scientifically selected samples um, and, and be in a position to 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 provide them to the, to MSR to bring back to the Earth. Um, and so at this point, we expect to continue to operate Perseverance within its tested, you know, envelope operating envelope. So we're not going to try to do new things with it. We're going to continue to, to perform um, as we've as we've designed it to um, to do what we want. And I think that. I think our uh, overall approach in adding the helicopters, as Jeff said, was to to provide a backup capability to to what is the prime path of, of perseverance, which we have a lot of confidence in, given that it's um, that it's been operating successfully. And I, I don't know that he mentioned it, but it's also very much. I think you all know perseverance is very very much of a twin to curiosity. And the Curiosity rover is coming up on its 10th anniversary on the surface of Mars, I think, next week. Uh, and so it's it uh, you know has been a good demonstration that that, that a rover of that caliber and that class uh, can survive on the surface of Mars for 10 years. And then, as as I'd mentioned earlier, you know the, the plan had always been to have Perseverance bring bring samples back. So we had two paths. Right. So that part of the plan is is not changed. All right. Thank you so much. On to the next question, please. Our next question comes from Jeff Foss with Space News. Your line is open. 
Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Um, how does this revised architecture affect the uh, projected cost of the overall Mars sample return campaign? How much money are you going to save with one fewer lander and without a uh, fetch rover? Thanks. Hi, th this is Jeff. So, so obviously, you know, one lander is, is much less expensive than two. We're, we're still in, in our you know, preliminary design phase. It, it's, uh, it's what we call our key decision point C, which is, is, will be about a year from now that we agency commits to cost. So during that period where you know, we're doing cost estimation and that's when we commit to a number. So, uh, all I can say right now is, you know, the obvious is one one lander certainly is, is much less costly than two. All right, moving on to the next question. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one. Our next question comes from Irene Quotes with Aviation Week. The line is not open. Thanks very much. Um, I'm a little confused about what um, Perseverance role um, in the sample return campaign. Do the samples that are stored on board, which previously were considered backup, become the primary sample set that's returned to Earth, or does Perseverance go back to where it's going to be caching samples on the ground and, uh, and, and pick those up for return? And then um, also maybe Jeff or Thomas or, or Richard, can you just maybe tell us a little bit about the novelty of the adding the helicopters to the architecture? Like how did that come about? Did, was there reluctance? Was everybody really eager to test it out? Or when did that very unique idea kind of move into what would be the, the main planning for the campaign? Thanks. Uh, perhaps I, I start in this case uh, first, if that's okay. Uh, the, the first thing I want to say, it's Thomas, of course, the head of science at NASA. Uh, the first thing is, from the beginning, we always had two options to get the samples back. And I, I just think that's prudent to do, especially remember when we started planning this, we actually hadn't even landed Perseverance on Mars. We didn't know, and frankly, there were a number of specific systems, uh, especially mechanical systems, that relate to the sample acquisition and so forth, they really, really wanted to get some experience with. So our risk analysis, so to say, um, perseverance has really been affected by the experience that we've had in the last year. So, so that is that is number one. So it's not that uh, perseverance was not uh, important and now it's important. Uh, we, we always wanted to have two, uh, and of course, uh, the sample fetch rover was one uh, of the options to do that. The other one. Uh, with perseverance, and we wanted to be sure that uh, both options were there. So in that sense, that was not a uh, substantial kind of zero order change. It was just uh, an evolution of that as we learned about uh, both uh, uh, curiosity, but also perseverance. Um, God, I just forgot the second question. Can you remind me? Um, yes, I was asking about what happens with the uh, the role of perseverance in the sample return if the cash samples aboard previously considered the backup become the prime to get back or if there's some other role. And then just a little bit about the story of how the helicopter became part of this operational mission. Who thought of that and how did that idea mature? So, uh, so again, on, on the, I think I try to address the first question as much as I can. And if others want to add, they should do that. On the helicopters, I just want to say uh, ingenuity was really important for that, right? Because, of, again, when we started planning, uh, helicopters, uh, you know, on Mars were a dream and an aspiration of a technology demonstration. And, and frankly, there's, uh, with the flights that are up there, you know, uh, 2,000 and, and, and counting and more, right? Because you know, we, you know, the we have ex gotten experience. And then, frankly, helicopters kind of as a tool here, have really moved in the realm of the possible. But that, by the way, why we do technology demonstration is to take things that were too risky or kind of crazy to think about at the beginning and put them in the realm of the possible. It's just in this case, the timing worked so out so fortunately that kind of in this conceptual design phase where multiple options are considered, uh, the helicopter option in fact became 
a reality. It can affect the entire team. Basically, felt comfortable with. Uh, Richard, do you want to take it away? Kind of again on the uh, on the first question I was asked, or or or, uh, or Jeff. Yeah, I'll just you know sort of repeat uh, and reiterate what what you said, right? That the, the plan all along has been that Perseverance would, after landing, would acquire a set of samples, and many mentioned this two two at a time, right? Two two for each rock, uh, with the idea that after they collected you know, on the order of 10 samples that it would place, uh, which drives along carrying the, the, you know, those samples, it would place the first set of 10-ish in the uh, Jezero area as a, as a so-called first or contingency depot, you know, as a sort of insurance policy. And then it would continue going, carrying the second copy and continuing to acquire new samples to the you know eventual point where it has used all the tubes. Um, and there's a total of 43 tubes on on Perseverance, and at that point it would have on approximately 30, 31 sort of tubes. That's what the scientists all along have wanted. That that's what they want, right? The contingency is a is a, exactly that a contingency. But the the idea all along was those 30 samples that Perseverance ends up uh, acquiring you know, over the next six, seven years are the ones that we want to bring back. And so those are the ones that either we would get directly from Perseverance, either we will get directly from Perseverance, or if Perseverance happens to, if we don't believe it's going to, it's going to have, it's going to last that long, then we can put them into a second depot on the surface, uh, at which point then the uh, SRL will land close to it, and it will use the two helicopters to go get the, those 30 tubes and bring them back to the MAV. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. So under the optimal plan, the uh, the depot at uh, Jezero Crater, those will those canisters just remain on Mars. That's right, and 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 you know certainly, hopefully, future opportunities to go get them, but we will have duplicate copies of all of those samples that will come back. So we're not, in a sense, missing anything by leaving those there. Well, there's an X prize for you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks so much, Irene. We'll move on to our next question. Our next question comes from Alexandra Whitsey with Nature Magazine. Your line is now open. Yeah. Hi, thanks for this. My question is for David Parker. So with the removal of the fetch rover, when is ESA going to next land a rover on Mars? Uh, thank you very much, uh, David Parker, speaking. It's a great question. Um, I'm afraid I can't uh, answer that with any, uh, definitively now. You're obviously referring to what happens to the Rosalind Franklin rover, which right now is uh, sitting in the clean room in uh, Tarsalania Space in Turin, waiting for its uh, trip to Mars. Uh, I can say that uh, since the decision to discontinue um, uh, or suspend the cooperation with Rosco Cosmos in the spring, the engineering team has been working at great speed to uh, find an alternative approach for delivering the Rosalind Franklin rover to Mars, and we've reported on that most recently to our governing council uh, just a few weeks ago. And I would like to say that uh, because it's been said already by uh, the Director General of ESA and indeed the Administrator of NASA, that there's been some excellent discussions between uh, NASA and ESA to explore the different options for uh, getting Rosalind Franklin to, to Mars. And uh, we still think that that is uh, something that we should try to do. Um, but eventually it will be a decision for our member states to decide at our upcoming ESA Ministerial Council meeting in uh, Paris uh, towards the end of this year, November this year. Thanks. Thank you. We will move on to our next question. Our next question comes from Marcia Smith. Your line is now open. Uh, thanks so much. My question is along those same lines for the uh, ESA representatives. So are you relieved that you don't have to build the sample fetch rover because now you can invest more in getting um, the ExoMars rover there, or are you disappointed? You know, how are you feeling about all this change? Well, maybe I should have a go at that question, and maybe Francois may want to, to follow up. Um, 
the uh, the engineer in me was fascinated by the sample fetch rover because it was designed to travel much faster than previous Mars rovers, uh, probably about four or five times as quickly over the surface. Um, but equally, uh, from a program management point of view, as soon as it became clear that um, the sample fetch rover could not be accommodated uh, alongside the Mars Ascent vehicle, uh, and therefore it would imply a second launch, uh, a second lander, and so forth. That implies cost and risk, um, and programs don't like cost and risk. So finding a way to uh, balance out the cost and risk by doing uh, undertaking the mission without the sample fetch rover makes a great deal of programmatic sense. So um, I, think you, I think that summarizes the, our perspective, but Francois, you may have some thoughts as well. Uh, thank you, David. Maybe one angle to, to, to answer the question is also to say, okay, we, we had reached preliminary design review with this uh, sample fetch rover development with Airbus uh, in, uh, in the UK. So, indeed, we have a number of technologies that were developed, uh, risks that were mitigated. We have even breadboards uh, uh, related to locomotion or related to uh, sample fetching, meaning robotics again. Uh, that were achieved by, uh, uh, by the uh, Airbus UK industry. Uh, but everything is not lost because those developments could be very much uh, uh, valid uh, if we would reroute them in the future to another kind of mission like conceiving a, a rover mission uh, to the moon. Uh, as you are aware, uh, ESA will propose as part of the uh, uh, exploration program at the Ministerial end of November, the, the missile that David mentioned before, uh, a large lunar lander uh, which would at the end to carry to, uh, to the moon either cargo or uh, payloads, or uh, 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 payloads that could be as well uh, roving uh, vehicles. Uh, so we are going to study now together with Airbus UK uh, how basically to redirect uh, the know-how that was developed uh, uh, in the past, in the last uh, 2.5 years, uh, in order to see uh, how we could reuse uh, those activities and the outcome of those uh, risk mitigation and breadboards uh, in order to, uh, to, uh, to prepare uh, potentially for a new development that could be targeted to another planet. Thank you so much. We will move on to the next question. Mm -hmm. Our next question comes from Leo Emery with Irish Television. Your line is now open. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, I think this is probably for David Parker. Just trying to understand uh, the role of the sample transfer arm. I mean, there was to be an arm on the fetch rover. This is obviously not the same arm. Um, can, can you just describe how this arm uh, will, what role it will play? Uh, and is, is this a new addition or was this always part of the MAV design? I, I wasn't entirely clear. Uh, and if I could maybe just sort of uh, be more precise, my understanding is that in a perfect situation, um, the Perseverance rover will back up to the MAV and the European STA will reach out and take each sample. Am I broadly correct in everything I say there? And I hope I am. Okay, thanks. Hi, Leo. Yes, absolutely. Your The last point is, is a correct understanding. And indeed, the sample transfer arm has always been part of the foreseen architecture. Uh, so it's been uh, studied by two different industrial contractors, and then we've moved forward with the preferred contractor signing the full development contract last week in Farnborough. Um, separately, the sample fetch rover would have had uh, an arm to um, pick up sample tubes, uh, but again, so that's no longer required. Uh, so yes, the sample transfer arm is fully extended. It's something like two and a half meters of reach. Uh, it's a multi-jointed, uh, very sophisticated uh, robotic uh, arm with end effectors designed to pick up the uh, sample tubes from the carousel on Perseverance on one side. And now, as you've understood, uh, the possibility to uh, pick up uh, sample tubes deposited on the surface by uh, one or other of these two uh, gripper helicopters. Is that clear now? Yep, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Leo. We will move on to the next question. Our next question comes from George Dvorsky with Gizmodo. Your line is now open. 
Hi, thanks everyone for uh, doing this today. I'm wondering, um, does the proposed change to the architecture now have any effect on the safety, um, and in, in particular in regards to the uh, issues of contamination? Did it alter anything, both in terms of what the helicopters might do, uh, the return of the samples? I'm just wondering if that was uh, any any part of the uh, did that enter into any part of the conversation as you guys were thinking about these changes? Thanks very much. This is Jeff. Uh, no, first order. We our 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 planetary protection regime re remains unchanged, and and this this doesn't introduce any any safety issues uh, that that we are having that are driving just other design changes. R Richard can. That's exactly right. The, the the encapsulation approach that CCRS follows and the Earth return are all the same, unchanged. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we will go on to the next question. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please again press star one. Our next question comes from Nadia Drake with National Geographic. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, this one I think is also for David Parker and it's following up on Alex's question about ExoMars and the Laval and Franklin rover. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share some of the options that you've been exploring for getting the Roswell and Franklin rover to the surface. Um, what sorts of partner agencies might be in the picture and what kind of timeline seems realistic at this point? Is 2028 still possible? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, yes, in short form, uh, a number of different options and launch dates are being explored. Um, you know, launch, uh, launches to Mars are possible roughly every two years or 26 months. Um, but uh, within that, there are several sub-options for launch dates, uh, and all of those are being uh, considered, but 2028 is one of the possibilities. Um, and so those trade-offs and considerations are continuing right now and will carry on uh, up until uh, the member states are ready to make a, uh, a decision on uh, whether or not to continue with the, with the mission. Thank you so much. We'll move on to the next question. Okay, our next question comes from David Curley with the Discover Channel. Your line is now open. Thank you very much. Thomas, not to belabor this point or anybody else, um, it, it always seemed as if um, with the fetch rover and the dropping and caching of samples that that was going to be the primary return. I understand redundancy and having two systems. Were they equal and is now Perseverance really the main uh, retrieval system? Thank you. Uh, you're asking me, right? It's Thomas here. Uh, yeah, I just, you tried to explain it, so I, I, I mentioned, I, I just didn't want to push any further. I'm just trying to get a sense, were they equal before and now Perseverance is more, you know, the, the main plan for retrieval? Yes, they had to be equal before, because frankly, uh, we, you know, if you look at the overall risk of getting those samples back, you know, kind of entirely relying on Perseverance was frankly far from realistic or reasonable. And, uh, you know, also, if you bring another rover there with its own lander, uh, the likelihood of that certainly, uh, as we know, landing on Mars is hard. It's not 100 percent either. So kind of if you looked at the mission overall from the beginning, uh, the, way, the way we uh, made the, you know, our had our discussion with uh, Europe, it was uh, kind of to have the two channels to really bring the samples back and, uh, and uh, have both of them available for the success of the mission. It is true that at this moment in time, based on the knowledge we have, both, again, an in-depth analysis from Curiosity and also what we've learned from Perseverance, we're a lot more comfortable to make uh, Perseverance the primary uh, place, the primary option of getting the samples there. And so for us, that is because of things we learned uh, on, on Mars, and it's also uh, because of things we uh, have uh, analyzed uh, that, frankly, we couldn't do before. So in that sense, it really has shifted uh, in terms of its uh, emphasis. Jeff, anything you wanted to add? No, I, I, Thomas, I think you, you got it all right. We, we had, we were 
planning on both options before. We, based on, as Thomas mentioned, the, the health of Perseverance, its performance to date, coupled with Curiosity performance with 10 years of, of history with the mobility system, we, we have confidence in, in, in relying on Perseverance and we're adding the helicopters to make sure we've, we've got a viable backup mechanism in the architecture. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question, please. Our next question comes from Leonard David from Inside Outer Space. Your line is now open. Thank you. Um, because of the revised architecture, is there kind of a need to do another independent review of cost and risk, something like the David Thompson uh, study that was done? Uh, the second part, I, I, I'd like to get back to David Parker, is the potential of using ExoMars for Mars sample return off the table? I'm going to uh, answer the first one. I just want to say how valuable the independent review that David Thompson and his team did was for the entire international team here. And frankly, many of the recommendations that they made, uh, many of the uh, kind of uh, issues that they surfaced were very much, uh, you know, verified by the team as they went through it and uh, uh, have been found valuable. Uh, we have, of course, a uh, standing review board uh, that is shared by Maria Zuber, uh, you know, Maria Zuber, uh, the, Dr. Maria Zuber, a very experienced uh, uh, scientist and, uh, you know, leader. Um, uh, and, and we have that independent review, uh, kind of independent assessment uh, at all times. It is also true that as I'm looking at the team going forward, you kind know, of any and all options of of helping the team remain on the table, but at this moment in time, I don't believe that uh, the, the pivot here kind of uh, certainly uh, kind of necessitates kind of a totally independent look because I think the transition has been very organic and with the right type of oversight uh, from independent uh, viewpoints such as uh, standing review board. David, I'll give it uh, to you for your question. Yeah, thank you very much, Thomas. Um, uh, it's a really interesting question, if I understand it, is could uh, somehow Rosalind Franklin rover be adapted to, to support the sample fetch, uh, so the Mars sample return campaign? Uh, it's an interesting thought experiment, but uh, when you start to think about it, the answer is, is fairly quickly no, because uh, Rosalind Franklin is built as a kind of mobile science laboratory uh, but with its key feature being exploration in three dimensions, i.e. the drill going two meters below the surface in order to acquire samples that are not damaged by radiation, uh, and therefore put those samples into an astrobiology laboratory. And all of that has been built and integrated and tested um, in quite extraordinary uh, cleanliness environment. Whereas on the other hand, the purpose of the sample fetch rover is not to carry out science itself, but travel rapidly, quickly, go and fetch samples and come back again. And it would be a little bit uh, like, uh, yeah, completely re repurposing and redesigning and rebuilding. So it, it doesn't make um, uh, uh, sense in the context of the Mars sample return campaign. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we do still have quite a few questions. I'm hoping we can get to, to three more, uh, and we are prioritizing those who haven't had a chance to ask a question yet. Um, but uh, please go on to the next question. Anyone who doesn't get a chance to ask a question here, we will, of course, try to answer your questions offline. Uh, but for now, let's go to the next question. Okay, our next question comes from Paul Marks with Aerospace America. Your line is not open. Hi. Um China has said it will bring home samples two years ahead of NASA and ESA from Mars. Um, it strikes me that removing a whole rover is quite a feat in streamlining the, mis the mission, as you've done getting rid of the fetch rover. So is it possible that as the decade moves on, you might be able to streamline it further and match or, or beat the Chinese in getting samples back? So I think the first thing I want to say is uh, that, uh, of course, uh, uh, I, I mean, I'm sure I speak for the international team here is that we uh, welcome any and all investments worldwide on the peaceful exploration of outer space, uh, and especially uh, as these uh, explorations are done kind of uh, with the principles of openness uh, and so forth. And, and so, so uh, I have to tell you that uh, uh, I don't know much 
uh, in detail mm-hmm. about uh, any other design uh, kind of outside of the one that we're working on. Uh, probably read the same story you did, uh, but I really don't uh, yes. know much. As to the flexibility in the future, I think I'm going to kick it to uh, uh, Jeff or, uh, uh, or Richard just to kind of uh, talk about that. So you know, what, what I will say is, is, is our architecture, you know, beginning with perseverance is, is in underway. We've, we've collected samples and then, and what we're doing is we've built an architecture and the complexity is driven by the desire to accommodate the need to go where the science takes us. And, and that's what perseverance has, has successfully been doing thus far is, is, is going right. to the places where the science team uh, b- believes there are, are worthy samples to to bring back, and it's it's that complexity that that kind of drives our our mission architecture. And uh, I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that. All right, thank okay. you. Uh, moving on to our next question. Our next question comes from Anton Munir. Your line is now open. Yes, hello. Uh, just one quick precision, please. Uh, with now the, the two helicopters, uh, do you plan to bring back the same weight of samples than uh, it was uh, with the, the fetch rubber? This is Jeff. I'll let Richard answer that question. Yes, the, the plan is to still have the capability to bring back the, the full number of 30 samples um, the OS, the orbiting sample canister that we're taking with us to bring the samples back, uh, has space in it for 30 samples, uh, and that's what we're we're going to bring back with the fetch rover, and what we will bring back whether Perseverance delivers it or the helicopters um, retrieve them. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for just one more question, uh, and then we will close up today. But our last question for the day, please. Our last question comes from Daniel Cleary with Science Magazine. Your line is now open. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, I just had another question about the number of sample containers. You say that uh, Perseverance is currently making duplicate samples, so it ha- keeps one uh, within itself and puts another in depots on the ground. If it continues to do that, doubling everything, it won't have end up with 30 you know, carrying around 30 samples because there's a total of 43 you said i just you know these numbers don't seem to add up how are we going to have 30 samples inside perseverance could i take that uh this is many wadwa um okay. MSL principal scientist um yeah so the plan is to collect the duplicate samples only within the jezero uh, creative campaign during that phase of the mission. And um, so up to this point, we have, uh, you know, the 43 tubes that are on there. We've got one tube that's filled with atmosphere. We've got a couple of tubes that are witness tubes, which is essentially blank, um, help us with sort of assessing blank values. And then we've got, at the current time, 10 that have already been, actually, the 11th sample was just successfully uh, sealed and stowed just 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 now actually so we've got 11 and we're going to be and all of those rock samples that we currently have they are essentially duplicates so two samples per different rock type and so the 11th one will have a 12th one that will be of the same rock hopefully and so what we plan to do uh, or what perseverance will do is to deposit a suite of something like 12 11 or 12 samples in the first uh, in the first depot within Jezero Crater. And so it'll have on board still something like 30 or 31 tubes uh, to carry with it as it goes along. And those, from, from that point on, though, the plan is not to collect duplicates. And so once that first initial uh, depot is situated, beyond that, there is not a plan to collect duplicates. And so the 30 tubes that will be carried on board Perseverance will uh, will thereafter essentially consist of the f- sort of 10 duplicates that we have from within Jezero, and then the additional sort of 20 or so samples will be sort of new samples that will be collected beyond Jezero Crater. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Can I ask a follow-up question? Uh, if that's the case, that you're going to be traveling around with 30 samples um, in Perseverance, 
what happens if there's some fault with Perseverance and you're having to rely on the helicopters to collect samples? Are they only going to be able to take the ones from Jezero Crater or will Perseverance be able to drop the ones that it's carrying? You know, what will you do in that eventuality? Right. So this Richard, I, I could jump in many if you want. The, the exactly what you said, right? That the, the plan will be. There's two options there, right? One is that if Perseverance has a problem, uh, we can uh, position it and and have it put the remaining tubes that it has, whether or not it be 30 or you know however many it has at that point, it can drop all the remaining tubes on the ground in a second in a second uh, depot. Uh, and right. so that's, that would be the way to, and then helicopters would go get it from, from that spot, um, picking them up one at a time, as I said, and taking them back to the lander. If under the worst case scenario, and we don't really think there are very many credible or almost any credible scenarios where Perseverance will flat out stop operating uh, with the, the sample tubes still inside of it, then we could send the helicopters and the lander, uh, the retrieval lander, to the to the Jezero uh, depot and get the first twelve as many uh, described. Does that yes, make sense? Thank you. It does. Thank you. Okay. Sure. And we are out of time. Sorry to cut it off. We've gone over a little bit. Um, as I said, there I know there are some other people who were hoping to ask ask additional questions, uh, do feel free to reach out to me, Karen Fox, or uh, the folks you've been in touch with as you've got information on how to join this media briefing. We will be airing this on YouTube, so you will be able to um, go back over it. And again, those media who received an email from us will also have information for how they can download a recording of this. Uh, so thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate it. And, uh, until next time, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you for your participation. That concludes today's call. You may disconnect at this time.